Well, welcome to worship this morning. We are so glad you are here and we have the opportunity to gather in the house of the Lord and enjoy the blessing of God as we come together. We are here to enjoy the blessed hope of God and we hope that God will bless you in the midst of our worship time together. If you haven't had the opportunity to prepare uh, today, we are going to do communion. So those at home, uh, if you wouldn't mind drawing upon your communion supplies, uh, that would be great. We're going to do communion like r first thing up this morning. So we would love you to be prepared for that. We hope that God blesses you in our time together and that somehow in some way you enjoy a special touch of God as well as a sense of the hope that God brings in the midst of his eternal presence. Uh, that's our hope this day as we worship. So we're glad you are here. We are going to move into communion, and if you all would like, you can grab your cups, get them prepared, because if you're anything like me, working with these little tabs is a lot of fun, isn't it? So, our call to worship this morning begins with the Passover meals call to worship, and I'll give it to you in Hebrew, just so you might have a cross-cultural experience, okay? Okay. Baruch ata Adonai Elohinu malach achum asher kedsha mu b'mit bota vesti vanu lehad lek nershel yom tov. You want to know what that means? Well, let me be your official spiritual interpreter of tongues. It says, blessed art thou, O God, our Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with thy commandments and commanded us to kindle the festival lights. And then the matron of the home would light the candles that would go on the Passover table as they enjoyed it together as a special symbolic movement that God's light is now with the family. And, and you have to understand, when people enjoyed Passover, they enjoyed it in family units. And I want you to take this moment to imagine Jesus' final, final Passover with his disciples. They were all reclining around the table because they didn't sit in chairs like us. They literally would have pillows and lay on them on one elbow, and on the other one they would feed themselves. And they were gathered for the Passover meal, which the Jewish population celebrated literally for thousands of years regarding the miraculous salvation from God, slavery and in Egypt, and how God led them out of Egypt and allowed them to become a nation of God. Now, what's interesting in this Passover meal is there would be four cups of wine, which represented many different things, but the first one represent uh, sanctification and it was held very early in the Passover meal and it was a cup to remind us that God sets apart this meal for his worship time and then after that a basin of water would be passed around and they would formally wash their hands together which was their personal sanctification so that they could be made clean and it would be held in the midst of the symbol that they were set apart by God. Then they would dip the parsley into the salt water. And the parsley represented the hyssop branch. Do you remember what happened with the hyssop branch? The Israelites in the first Passover meal were told to take a hyssop branch, dip it in the blood of the lamb that was slain for the Passover meal and put it around the windows and around the doorway. And that was their symbol of faith, that they trusted God who was going to send the angel of death to all the firstborn in Egypt. And he would pass over their house with that symbol on their windows and on their door wells. Well, they would dip that hyssop branch called parsley and consume it, and the salt water that they dip it in represented the tears that had flowed from their eyes through the long time that they were enslaved by Egypt to do the awful things. And then, can you imagine? Jesus, at this point, leaves disciples 
in the next part of the service, knowing full well what was going to happen to him, knowing full well that he would be the final Passover lamb whose blood would be shed for all of the people regarding their sins so that the death angel would pass over those who would trust Jesus. And they would have prayed this, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the earth. And at that moment, the host, Jesus himself, the one who was before creation, the one who creation was made through, as John tells us, leans over and takes the middle matzah out of the special bag where there were three, and he would break it. And that breaking of that matzah bread, that cracker-like thing, would represent the broken backs of of the Israelites under the burden of slavery. But now, in the midst of it, he would take that matzah with his disciples like we're going to take ours. And he would pray. Let's pray together. Lord, as we enjoy the gift of your sustenance of the bread, as it represents the baseline of life for us, and as it represented for Jesus, his brokenness done for us, for our relationship with you, help us, Lord, celebrate the gift you give us. In Christ's name, amen. And he would say, this represents my body. Take and eat. Now, the disciples at this time had to be wondering, why would he have changed this aspect of the ceremony? Why does this, pos- this, this Passover matzah, matzah symbolize the broken backs of the Israelite now represents Jesus' body? Because Jesus was pointing to a certain messianic prophecy that said he was the suffering servant who would die for the sins of the world. And Jesus is doing all this, all the while knowing what he's going to encounter in the days ahead. They would have enjoyed many other parts of the Passover meal when they would have gotten to what's called the third cup. The third cup was known as the cup of redemption. It is based on God's promise in Exodus 6.6. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm with the great judgments. It is a reminder of the Lamb's blood, the price paid for Israel's redemption. Can you imagine Jesus at that time taking this cup of redemption, knowing he was going to pay the price for redeeming all of humanity that would follow him, trust him, all of humanity who was before him, during his reign of history, and even after his human history. Could you imagine being the one who was leading them through this, knowing you were going to be sacrificed for the shed of your blood for the redemption of humanity? And he turns to the disciples and he prays, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our King, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then Matthew tells us, He took the cup, and he says to them, as we open ours up, drink it all, all of you. And then he would share with the disciples, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, he would say, I will not drink of this cup, the fruit of the vine, until the day I drink it anew with you in thy Father's kingdom. Can I ask you a question? Where's the hope for Jesus in this moment? Where is his hope? He knows what lies ahead. He knows it isn't going to be pleasant. He's telling the disciples, one of you will betray me, another will deny me three times, and he knew the rest were going to flee. 
and then he's in the garden praying shaking sweating because he knows what he's about to endure he is the final and the greatest Passover lamb and this can only mean one thing his slaughter and now he's praying heavenly father Take this cup away. Three times he would pray that. Take this cup away. Where's his hope? Where was Jesus' hope? His disciples slept through the ordeal. Where was his hope? And then finally he would say, Your will be done. Your will be done. Let's pray together. God, as we take this time to celebrate you and what you've done through your precious son's gift, who was sent because you love the world, who died to bring the world into back into your being so that we could enjoy life with you today and life with you on into eternity. So where would Jesus' hope be in the most trying times of his life? The simple answer is in his heavenly father. And he knew no matter what he would endure, including his death, death on the cross, he would trust his heavenly father. And you know, ultimately, that is where our hope must be. In the same heavenly father that saw his own son go through his death and led him through to his resurrection. How do we unleash this hope that Jesus had in our own life so that we can have hope no matter what we walk through? How do we unleash hope? How do we grow hope? And one of the things we're trying to teach in the midst of this sermon series is thriving people. Learn to thrive for one significant reason. They commit faithfully to God, and they do what they know God calls them to do. And that produces inner strength and hope. They are committed to faith, trust, and relationship with the one they know who created them, redeemed them, Love them enough to die for them and rose again so that we might have that eternal presence with God. And God is what we have to put our trust in no matter what happens in this life. We need to believe God has us in every moment. God has us in life. God has us in struggle. God has us in celebration. God has us even in death. And God has us. All the way to eternity. You see, it's important for us to understand that hope isn't just believing in a better future. Hope is we believe in the one who provides eternal future, no matter what we are walking through. And hope is planted in us through the gift of the Spirit when we trust Jesus. And while our faith is planted in us in grace and love in Jesus, there must be a plan within all of us. There's got to be a pathway that enables us to get through whatever it is we are getting through to survive in hope. And that's the reason we're spending this time in this sermon series. There is so much hopelessness in our society, our culture, and even in sometimes our own hearts. And we need the hope of God to come into us once again. And I pray as we're going through this series, you will experience God's hope. Today we're going to finish up our discussion that we've been in in the midst of the past several weeks, where we've been focusing on the seven factors that we can practice to improve our sense of hope. Now, there were several things we've talked about. Factor number one was recharging our batteries. That means taking the time you need to take with God 
to lift you up. It means taking the time to do whatever it is you need to do. Exercise. Take quiet time. Withdraw from people. Maybe you be with people. I don't know. It depends how you're created. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Each one of those lets you build up your hope quotient and refreshes you. We talk about uh, refocusing on our future by asking, what can become of this? We talked about raising our expectations for hope. And we talked about responding with our strengths, you know, the things that God has built within us, the experiences in life. We talk about uh, the things that we are spiritually gifted to do that naturally comes out of us. And that, in putting our energy in that, raises our hope quotient and our hope levels in life. Now, as we talk about the fifth one, I'd like you to take a moment, turn to the person closest to you, and say, thank you. Say thank you. If you're at home, tell the person next to you, thank you. Thank you. Turn to another person, tell them thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Doesn't this seem odd? <laughs> but here's what I want you to enjoy. Oh, and by the way, if you're on Facebook, put a note in your Facebook lead if you're watching us. Thank you. Thank you. Now let me tell you why we're doing this. One of the greatest reasons we can have a hope-filled life is relationship. It's relationship. A relationship can be as simple as sitting next to someone for 60, 70, 80 minutes in worship. It could be as simple as Living out your marriage vows. It could be as simple as getting together with a neighbor. It's in relationship that hope comes. So thank you. You see, the Bible clearly tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 4, two are better than one because they have good reward for their to toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other, but woe to the one who falls alone and doesn't have help to get up. I'll tell you about that later. Yes, relationships are challenging. Yes, relationships are complex. Yet, we're told two are better than one. So here's the principle. The fifth principle is don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. The experience, to experience hope in our lives, we've got to have community. You can't do this alone. Never underestimate the power of close friendship because taking the time to prioritize friendship is the best decision you'll ever make in your life. Robert Putman says it this way in his book, Going Alone, The Collapse and the Revival of Human Community. He says, the single most common finding in the last half century of research of life satisfaction, not only here in the U.S., but throughout the world, is that happiness is best predicted by the breadth and the depth of social relationships. As a rough rule of thumb, if you belong to no groups, if you join just one group, you cut your risk of dying that year in half. In half. It is true, meaningful relationships do boost our lifespan and our health. And without the collection of close relationships in our life, personal hope plunges. The second we think we are in this all by ourselves, the hope quotient begins to dive in us as we experience hardship, as we go through times of suffering, when we experience various degrees of betrayal with close relationships and meaningful relationships, our hope quotient just tumbles. So, in order to get all the hope we need, we need relationships in our life. And I want to talk about five different relationships you need in this segment of the sermon. First of all, we are called to be connected with people who are dream casters. We need to surround our 
ourselves with people who can got the spiritual gift of boldly being able to see in faith and create big dreams so we can hook into them so they can help us cast a dream that moves us out of our current conundrum. Where a vision is declared, so our lives orient towards that vision. God is bigger than ourselves, and we need people to help us see how God might be bigger than ourselves in the current circumstance of life that we're in, no matter where we are. I like to hang out with these people. These people are fun. They got ideas. They got thoughts. They got concepts to fuel the vision to see what God wants us to do. This makes my thinking bigger. That's why my entire life in ministry, I've always hung out with pastors more experienced than me and a lot smarter than me, which was easy to find. It makes me think bigger. It allows me to see the possibilities. It allows me to see what God could do as I look even at other churches. I want to be around people who can grow my mind, who can blow my heart up, who can inspire me to see what God is doing and dream what might God do here. Otherwise, just living in Maslin could kill your dreams. This can be a hard place. But when we have dream casters, we can get through anything. So dream casters are one. The second type of relationship that we all need are soul sharpeners. We need soul sharpeners. Now, soul sharpener does two things very well. Number one, they, they help us develop emotionally. And, and it's that sense of not being sometimes, I should say, in a kind, sharp way bring critique to us. It's that concept where iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens the wits of another. A soul sharpener says, you know, you need to get off of that and grow up. Someone who is willing to challenge you and grow you. Someone who's just not going to go, oh, it's so bad. Someone's going to say, you know, I've seen this in your life over and over again. It's something you need to change. They love you. They want you to grow, and they challenge you to grow spiritually, which is the second thing. Look what Paul writes Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Then uh, you notice it's not coming on the screen. Why? I want you to use your Bibles. Let me sharpen your soul for a minute. Get into your word. How's that? That's what a soul sharpener does. A soul sharpener. Like Paul was sharpening Timothy, he says, Hold to the standard of sound teaching, Timothy, that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul's challenging Timothy. He's saying, come on, live up to it, Timothy. Do what I taught you. You see, a soul sharpener will come along next to you and say, how's your walk with Jesus going? A soul sharpener will come up to you and say, what is God doing in your life right now? They're the ones who help grow you spiritually. They're asking because they don't want you to settle for second best. They ask you because they want to stir you up emotionally and spiritually. We need soul sharpeners all around us. We need them to speak to the deep places of our lives. A third thing we need to have are models and mentors. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. Well, duh, right? If you want to become wise, walk with the wise. We need people in our lives that inspires our intellect, that we can enjoy the model and see and follow that model. They've got more experience than we have. They walk in grace, but also grow up. I try to spend time with younger pastors all the time because I got a wealth of knowledge they need to have. And it's a blessing to do. It's fun to do. And I have hung out with pastors also so I can gather information from them and allow it to shape me. If you don't have anyone in your life who inspires you, either in the midst of your struggle or in the midst of your greatness, if you don't have one there going for you, you know what your problem is? It's probably arrogance or you're spending way too much in the wrong rooms of life. We're called to hang out with models. 
We need people around us who can pour into us, grow us, allow us to glean from them so we can grow as well. We need to be exposed to healthy models, models that help us see what a good marriage is, models that help us see what good parenting is, models that help fill in whatever blank you might have. Jesus, Paul says of Jesus this, be imitators of me, Paul said, for I am as Christ. He is a mentor to them. He's saying, put it into practice. Well, not only do we need dream casters, soul sharpeners, models and mentors, but we need a fourth thing. And that is heart healers. Heart healers. They are the person who gives you the gentle, lengthy, uncomfortable glance. They're not the ones who just, as they walked in by, just say, how are you? And keep walking. They're the ones who say, how are you doing? And they look into you like they really want to hear, right? And they look at you with that deep glance. And they say, no, I really mean, how are you? They have a soft pastoral voice, but yet a deep presence. And they can dive into our being and discuss the condition of our heart. Solomon states in Proverbs 4.23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. We need the people in our lives that help that spring flow forth. The heart is that place where the emotions and the intellect and the decision mechanisms all come together. And yes, there are times we've got to make tough decisions. There are times our heart hurts because we know we've got to make a decision. And a heart healer comes alongside of us and helps us see where to go with all grace. They're very pastoral. And... If we don't have people who connect to our hearts, we basically kind of die and lose that support. And God has put them them to target us. And here's the truth. People who have their hope in their hearts experience as much hardship as the rest of us. But here it is. If you have someone who connects to your heart and allows you to raise your hope question, quotient, then... Your hope will grow no matter what you're walking through. These are the people who do not allow cynicism to grow in your life and to build in your heart and so that we can grow to see the presence of God. And in the place of cynicism, we become hopeful. In the place of bitterness, we experience God's bitterness when they connect with us and they help us encounter healing and help us keep going. Well, I had to change the answer to this fifth one and make it more appropriate for worship. We all need bum kickers. Do I need to tell you what the English word bum means? And I do mean proper English. We need people who have the courage and the discernment to see the stuff in our own lives that needs to be called out in our own life. Um, I have one in my family. You're wondering who she is? <laughs> I'm telling you, man, if you ever need your bum kicked, go talk to Sarah. She's got a gift. It's a special gift. And here it is. These people have the courage and the discernment to approach you. They aren't mean. They aren't cruel. They are simply telling you the truth and telling you to shape up. Now, bear in mind, we don't like these people a lot, but we need them. Proverbs 27, 6 says it this way. Wounds made by a friend are intended to help, but an enemy's kisses are much to bear. Oscar Wilde said, true friends stab you in the front. <laughs> 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 
These people got no problem coming up to you and say, you know what, I see this in your life and you need to change it. Get your act together. We need people who we can trust, who we can lean on in life, and that sharpen us. So we got dream casters, we got soul sharpeners, we've got models and mentors, heart healers, and bum kickers. Do you have these folks in your life? Because if you don't, you need them. And don't expect one person to fulfill all these roles. That's a unique person if you find out. And your hope quotient depends upon it. You got to build those relationships up so that it can spur you on. Genuine friendships are not found, but they're built. Build these relationships because you cannot do it alone. And you know what? You can either build community or die. I think what's so important about that is, um, well, I can speak for myself, and maybe you feel this way as well, but sometimes I think uh, just the right big statement will do it. If I can just put the right words together and I can declare it and, you know, I have the biggest audience and have the, night, the message is there and I just say it, then we can change everything. We can fix everything. Um, if I, if we just hear the right sermon, man, that's going to change the whole world. And I'm not saying that's not possible, but as we're seeing through this, this process Roger's leading us through is it has so much more to do with the relationships that we have with one another. And it's not the grand statement so much as it is the quiet moment with somebody that you know, and that knows you, that you can suffer alongside, that you can rejoice alongside that can kick you in the butt if you need it, uh, or that will understand if you kick them in the butt. Uh, and, and if you don't have that equity or that depth of the relationship, then you're not going to have the room to do any of that, the, no matter what your role is. And so I think that's really important to remember, that we put our time and our focus into learning about it on a, in a Sunday morning in a sermon capacity. We need to take this stuff out into our lives and develop those relationships, and it can't just be our Sunday morning worship. It has to be every moment um, because it's not the big statement that's ultimately going to change anybody's world, but when you're there for somebody when they need it. And that is uh, the true hope of community that uh, we get to sing about now together. So I would love if you would uh, stand with us and sing along. scared and trembling we are the desperately lost we are the lone and hopeless we are the outcast orphans we are the ones no one wants but a father is coming for us you adopted a sin We were the weak and useless. We needed rescue and help. We were the long forgotten. We were the disregarded. We couldn't care for ourselves. But our Father was coming for us. Did a sin, and you made us your own. You adopted a sin, and 
too young to know you were a rich man. I just knew you loved me. Let's sing that chorus one more time, just our voices. You adopted a sin, and you made us your own. You adopted a sin, and you gave us a hope. Thank you. You may be seated. Isn't it wonderful to be able to sing, you adopted us in? Each one of us are adopted into the family of God, and God has made us his own. And because he has made us his own, through the presence of his spirit, he's given us a home. A home. You know, sometimes we need to take the time to remember God has adopted us, and he resides with us, and he has created home with us. Not just now, but forever. And unless we take our time to focus on God and to remind ourselves that he is at home with us, we can often encounter burnout. And brokenness. You see, the sixth point to increasing our hope factor, our hope quotient, is we have got to take time to replace our burnout when we have it. Have we all had burnout? Oh, yeah, we all get burnout. But in the midst of it, we have got to replace our burnout with the rhythm of God. One of the most positive things I think about this COVID-19 nightmare has been the dream in the midst of the COVID-19 nightmare. Have you experienced the dream in the midst of it? It has forced us to slow down, hasn't it? It has forced us to change our habits. It has forced us to spend time. Crazy as that is, especially if you're a Smith. <laughs> They're up in the balcony. I got to pull their legs sooner or later. You see, prior to COVID, you and I have been running around willy nilly everywhere, thinking that's our purpose in life to run around crazy. And we had no margins in our life. And we were missing the power of rhythm in our life. You see, life without margins is a life without hope. When we are overloaded, when we are overcommitted, we don't have time to enjoy the joy. Our sense of perspective is gone. Our confidence is out of here. And, and, and if we do not accept time limits, if we do not take the time to put emotional limits and family limits and marriage limits on the important relationships, we will become burnout. 
and miss our rhythms that God has built into us. And we've got to build boundaries and margins where we can do the things we can do to build ourselves up, build our families up, build our marriage up, build our children, and build the people who are around us up. So how do we replace burnout with rhythm? And I want to give you three quick answers. Number one, divert daily. You have to divert daily. Take your devotional time. Do whatever it is that you can go on a walk, whatever it might be, to divert daily. You need to think of your day in terms of major segments. For some of us, it might be three segments. It might be four segments or five segments. But if you think about it simply in terms of three segments, say 7 to noon, noon to 6, 6 to 10 at p.m., one of those sections every day should be for you to have your daily diversion and help your family divert and do the things that are going to build you up. Pick one of those and... Enjoy it. Let the two be outputs and one of them be an input. We need to input into our life and replenish us or else we're just going to wither away and die. How else do we replace our burnout with rhythm? Well, you also need to think in terms of a weekly rhythm. We need to withdraw weekly. The Bible calls it a Sabbath. You withdraw from the tensions of the week and the blur of life. Take that day and focus on your relationship with the Lord. Focus on your relationship with people around you and your family and your marriage and your friends. When I was a young kid, we would always go to worship and right after worship, go to grandma's house and enjoy dinner together. And all the generations would be there. We would play cards in a time you weren't supposed to play cards. <laughs> Pinochle. And just enjoy each other. Walk around the farm. Enjoy life. Enjoy each other. And then get home in time to watch Lassie. <laughs> uh, I'm expressing how old I am. Yeah, they watched Lawrence Welk. That bored me to death. So I went home and watched Lassie. But anyway, you got to do those things weekly that are going to rejuvenate you in the Lord and with your family. Focus on the relationship. Build a rhythm of spirituality. And then afterwards, I would go back to youth group. How many of you enjoyed BYF growing up or MYF or CYF, whatever it is, whatever denomination you stood for, for Baptist Youth Fellowship? Fifty years ago, they call it the Baptist People's Union. You know what that stood The Baptist Young People's Union. You know what that stood for? Think about it. Baptist BYPU. Don't you want to join something like that? BYPU? That's why they changed the name. So you got to do that. Uh, another thing we have to do is we've got to replace burnout with a rhythm annually. Annually. I don't mean just take a vacation, although vacations can help. One of the things I try to do on an annual basis is sometimes I'll go out and fly out to Maggie's house in Colorado Springs. Why? Because nobody knows me. Number two, she is the most heavenly person I know on earth, with the exception of a couple other older folks. I don't have to perform. She won't let me do dad projects. She won't do anything. She just wants me to come and rest and be with her. So when she goes to work, I go to the coffee shop. And while I'm at the coffee shop, I've got my computer open. I'm praying. I'm studying scripture. I'm trying to put sermons together for the next coming year. I, I try to do all the things that are going to build into me annually so I can get a breath for the new year that's coming. You younger families, you need to get away from your kids. My wife and I on our anniversary would always go away from our, with our kids, enjoy our own quiet time, and then we would ask the hard questions. Where do we need to go this year? What do our kids need to encounter? What's God calling our family to be and to do? You've got to take that time to retreat annually, to build the relationship you have with God, to give you a wider vision, and to build a stronger relationship within your marriage and your family. 
Retreat annually. It's wonderful. If you need places to retreat, call me. I got tons of places you can go. So I take the time to read and to rest. And you know what's fascinating about that annual time? It's amazing how I can see the holes in life. You know what I mean by the holes in life? Sometimes our lives get in such patterns of stuff that we don't see the holes. And when we withdraw totally out of it and take time to reflect, pray, and renew ourselves, it suddenly then things come to us that are like, I can't believe I hadn't seen that before. If you want to know when the church of First Baptist is in trouble, it is when I go on an annual retreat. Because I come back and I see the holes. I come back and I got new dreams and visions. I come back and I'm going, oh, oh, oh this is going to be hard on the people. <laughs> but that's how God renews me annually. You see, distance creates clarity. Clarity creates rest. Rest creates hope. We need to get away on a daily basis, a weekly basis, and an annual basis so we can return, renew, enjoy new vision and clarity, and enjoy hope and understand where are we supposed to be and what is God calling us to do in terms of investing our lives. Nothing is more important. So, take the time. When you're in burnout especially, to enjoy a new rhythm. And here's the interesting thing. If you enjoy this rhythm, a lot of times you're able to enjoy no burnout. Is that not a gift? You see, we need Jesus in our life day by day, week by week, year by year. I like that so much. Terry, come and lead us in our first hymn. everybody um, first before we go to the hymn I have to explain something um, the last time I tried to sing a solo if anyone was here I couldn't get any sound out I went to an eye ears nose and throat physician and um, I knew there had to be an organic reason for that so he did several laryngoscopies in the office and uh, my right vocal cord is almost doesn't move at all so my high register is gone it's just totally gone so um, when Tammy let me know today that she wasn't going to be here I of course said I would do this right now and I, I didn't even hesitate but we'll see how the songs go and she had asked Jen, too, but Jen's in Kids Kingdom. She's got her feet up there, so you got me. My name's also Bum Kicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's been a victim. Trusting in my father's wise bestowment. 
That explains the eyes of terror I saw when you came up, Terry. <laughs> you did very well. You did very well. You know, the, the, the third verse of that hymn is really interesting to me. It says, when I walk through the dark, lonesome valley, my Savior walk with me there. And safely his great hand will lead me to the mansions he's gone to prepare. Then the chorus, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, right? All the days of my life, all the days of my life. You see, in order for us to have hope, the eternal hope, we have to put our eyes on the one who brings goodness and mercy all the days of my life and all the days beyond my life. Which leads us to the seventh and last factor to raise our hope quotient in life. Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Did you catch that? Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, right? You know that part. So that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. You see, I believe hope comes in our life when we walk with God through Jesus Christ and being led by the Spirit to accomplish the work of the kingdom of God here on earth and on into eternity. But make no mistake, we are dealing with an evil one as well. If you don't believe it, just work in the booth. I'm not saying about those guys up there. I'm saying it about the technology. You see, the, the devil wants to steal your joy and your hope. And we have all got to play a great defense in order for that not to happen. All sports teams have to have a great defense to be a winner. You want to know who's going to win tonight's game? The one with the better defense. Both have phenomenal quarterbacks. Both have phenomenal offenses. But the one with the best defense is going to be the one that wins. All sports teams have to have a great defense. And you know what? You're no different. you got to have a great defense. So what can we do to help keep the devil at bay and engage God more? Well, there are several things we can do. Real quickly, never make major decisions when you're down. Number two, respond to bad news in good ways. We are the gospel people. What does that mean? We're the good news people. Even when bad news happens to us, not that we have to be light or trite about it, but we've got to look for the good news in the midst of the bad. We've got to ask, what's God want me to do? And then finally, when bad news comes, you got to shake it off and step up. Shake it off and step up. So number one, never make a decision when you're down. I tell all families who walk through grief, do not make any major decisions now. You got people who want you to make major decisions, especially if you're a spouse who just lost a spouse. They, I don't know how they find this out, but they call you up and say, you need a new roof. You need new windows. I have seen people who said, I got to get out of this house. I'm moving away. In the midst of their grief, only later to realize it was the wrong thing to do. Never, ever make a major decision while you're down. You need to ask, what does God want me to do? How do I do that? Every morning, I write out my resignation to this job. <laughs> I never send it. It's been a while since I've done that, but 
I can tell you, when Monday morning hits their times, I'm like, <laughs> ooh, delete. <laughs> Never make a decision when you're down. I tell people all the time, don't talk to me Monday morning. It ain't good. If I'm having a meeting with you on Monday morning, be ready. The bum kicker's coming out. The second thing you need to do is you need to respond to bad news in good ways. When I was walking through my current difficulty with my dad, who's 90 years old, who's been struggling, he had hip surgery, and we thought he was going to go into a rehab center for a while to get his strength up, they sent him home. The dude fell four times. And you talk about anger starting to move in. Righteous anger is a good thing. And I'm starting to think, what are we going to do next? And all the while, I had been making plans to get him into an independent living down here if we couldn't get him in a rehab circumstance. Twice, professionals, all of them, said he needs to go to rehab. Twice, that doctor in some faraway area who works for the insurance company denied us. Well, the third time, I fixed his wagon. When my dad fell a fifth time, we called the EMS. They took him to the hospital, and finally, this past Sunday, a week ago, they finally got him placed in a rehab center. I don't know what those people did different than the first two, but they got him into a rehab center. I saw him yesterday. He is having the time of his life. He looks better now than he's looked in six months. He's having social interactions. He's doing the rehab. He says, I'm even doing more than they're telling me to do. That's what Marines do. That's what Albers do. And we kept looking for the good news in the bad news cycle. And we were working on it to get him into a rehab center or an independent living so he could be watched. We were working on hopefully the other appointment, and finally it worked out. You've got to be able to constantly think, how do I respond to bad news in a good way? And then finally, when bad news comes, and you know what? It will come. If you're human, you can bet on it. You've got to shake it off and step up. I was walking in here this morning, and I uh, was right over here by the carriage house, and my feet slipped on the ice, and I went down with my backpack on me, and I was there. The salt truck had just left. And I'm going, will someone please call? Will someone please help Pastor Roger get up? Please? There's no one looking. Can, can no one come? And help a 62 and a half year old man get up again. There I am laying on the flat cold ground going, poor pastor, poor pastor. Someone's got to haul this fat body up. <laughs> it's 620. No one's here. I had a choice. I could lay there, or I could get up. For some reason, I don't like the cold, so I got up. That's covered in snow. I'm shaking it off. We don't have a choice. We as Christians are resurrection people. And you know what that means? Jesus got up on the third day. And you know what that means to us? We got to get up when we're knocked down. Even on the last day of our life, we are blessed with a God who is going to get us up. All great people of faith encounter bad news. Nehemiah found out that Jerusalem was decimated. And he found out God called him to fix it. And then he got into it and he's got to be wondering, what did I do? How am I going to deal with this? 
And he does. He organizes the people to build the walls. They're building the walls, and he found out that various communities around Jerusalem didn't like him building the walls. So they were going to attack him. And he could have said, oh, they're going to attack him. God wanted me to build this wall, but I don't think we can do it. No. He got up. And he organized his people to keep building the wall with one hand and have a spear in the other. And he put lookouts. It meant things got done slower, but they got done. Can you imagine being Elijah the prophet, trying to teach Jezebel, that wicked queen, over and over and over again to turn to the Lord, and over and over and over again, she's trying to create his demise. He shakes it off. And he steps up. You see, when we walk with God and have Jesus placed in the spirit of God within us, it allows us to have a resource within us that allows us to get up. You know, the great running back, Walter Payton, was asked, what is it that motivates you? He says, every time I get knocked down, I've got to get up. And the presence of God can spur us on. And that presence of God can help us overcome our sin, which, by the way, is a hope killer. And that presence of God resources us to keep going on and on and on and keep seeing the ways that God can lift us up and out of the mess we are in and pull us out of the valley of the shadow and that God can lift us up out of the pits of despair and allow us to keep our vision on the one who brings hope. You see, when you walk with God, when you make God a priority in your life and our first priority, then you see hope like you've never seen it before. You see, when you utilize these seven factors together and place them as foundational points for your life, our God can build our hope up and into our very lives so that we can abound in hope, so we can also be hopeful to other people, and so we can be a hope receptacle and pass it out because this world needs hope more than anything right now. we got to bring it. And that means we have to be the example. It means we got to get up one more time than we're knocked down as long as we earthly, physically can do it. And even when we can't, We got to be like my old man who, when he's laying in bed, still does his dumb exercises because he's got hope. He will overcome. That's what God calls us. Now, next week, I give you a little insight. We're going to look at how we can be hope to the world. Have you ever been frustrated? looking at the world around you, wondering how do I impact those pygmies in the Amazon? Have you ever been frustrated and see disaster over yonder and wonder how can I help them? How can I improve their hope? Have you ever seen that dog commercial and wondered how can I help them? Man, if you don't see that and don't have a passion there, you don't have passion at all. (laughs) For human beings, I'm like, they got themselves in their own mess. But poor, hopeless dogs and cats. Well, at least poor, hopeless dogs. (laughs) If that doesn't move you, nothing moves you. So how can I be hope to those things that move me? We're going to look at that, and you know what the main purpose of next week is? To help you release your guilt and focus where God would have you focus regarding our hope to the world. May God bless you. A couple of announcements for you. Number one, we start FPU tonight. If you don't know how to run your finances, show up at 4 o'clock, okay? We'll be in the carriage house. We'll be safe. We'll have our distance. Come to FPU. Secondly, after this service, we were going to have the business meeting, and some folks are going to pass out the documents to you. For those of you online, sorry. We're not letting our business be known to the world. (laughs) We're just going to let it be amongst our members. Thirdly, and most importantly, the young people of our congregation 
our staff primarily who are of, of the same age group lost a real close friend this week by the name of Adam Yoder. Adam grew up, I think, in the Beach City area, somewhere out that way. He was about the age of Andrea and Brett. And he was a missionary to Ecuador. And he had a pulmonary embolism, and he ended up dying, I think, Thursday night. You know, dealing with death is a hard thing. But when you get, like, my age, it's something you kind of expect. But for young people, they haven't had as many experiences that challenge them to work through it. So this was a real hit in their gut. So be praying for them. Adam was in Ecuador uh, serving the Lord, teaching, uh, and, and I had them all leave today because his funeral's at 11 o'clock today, so I wanted to make sure they were all home and online and could see it, so pray for them. In the meantime, we will place our hope on the eternal one. We will place our hope in the one who promises life after death. We will place our hope in the one who Adam is dancing with and bowing in humble adoration, being totally blown away by the glory of God. Is that not where our hope is? May God bless you. And may you walk out with that type of hope. Amen? Amen. See you folks who are online. We are now going to encounter our next step in an important step in the life of our